poker itself. I mean, like I played poker in, uh, I, 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 would, I would have to go and check. Like, I don't know how many countries I've played poker in anymore. Uh, the, and poker is like a very different game in different countries and locales. Uh, there's certainly a vibe to American poker to, depending on where you are in Europe, there's like, you know, almost a regional vibe uh, or just really? a di- different distinctive country for sure for sure I guess, and, I, can, uh, I guess I could see that yeah oh absolutely even in the United States like you can you can feel some degree of regional difference like there's a big difference between the vibe and energy in a tournament room at the Borgata in Atlantic City on the east coast and one in California or Las Vegas uh, oh, sorry so, you've been to Atlantic City Oh, it's, it's, it's okay. It's all right. And it's (laughs) it's actually a great place to go play poker. I wouldn't necessarily recommend Atlantic city as a vacation destination, but the Borgata as a tournament stop was actually, I always kind of looked forward to it. Strangely enough. Yeah. You know, nobody, nobody talks of Atlantic city. Um, but the Borgata did a nice job and their events were fun. And I liked the East coast energy. It was a loud and talkative style of poker. It was a little more emotional than we see in a, a lot of the United States. And uh, it was entertaining. All right. I'm curious about these other sort of uh, uh, vibes from mm-hmm. the other places that you've experienced. I think I know what you mean. But why don't you tell the audience a little bit about what, what the differences are? I mean, I would just say some things that were really distinctive to me. In Australia, I was there during their poker boom. It was a few years after the one in the United States, and especially because Joe Hashem won the World Series main event in 2005, they experienced a really big poker boom. But Australia is also kind of small, so there was only so many places to play poker. So it really felt like when you were in Crown Casino's poker room, you were in like the very center the very mecca of Australian poker and anybody who wanted to play would come down and play with us. So like, you know, Australian celebrities like Shane Warren, for example, who's, you know, a cricket legend and a guy who unfortunately passed away recently. I mean, he'd be just, he'd just come down there and play with us. It was just like such a, a hangout. It was such a social vibe in Australia. Like you'd start with poker and then you'd go out afterwards. Um, in China, what really stood out to me was the larger female percent of the, the larger percent of the field being female than almost anywhere else. Like really? I, I haven't played that many tournaments in China, but the ones I have play, it, played, it really stood out to me that like in America, poker by percentage is a man's game. It's like it's like ninety five or ninety seven percent male. Like if you look at the World Series main event players, you know we get like six seven thousand players every year, and like three hundred of them are female. And in China, it felt like 20, 25% of the field was female. Um, so that really stood out to me. Uh, That's crazy. I, I haven't right. seen that, but I presume you're right. I haven't really played any tournaments in China or um, too many tournaments in Asia. I've been there mostly for the cash games. Yeah, that, that certainly stood out to me. Um, and then there's also just like weird little experiences that come on along the way. Like I played a tournament in Korea once where the government came and <laughs> shut down the tournament on like day two or day three because it was running in a convention space and not in a formal casino space and that either violated some form of gaming law or they used it as an excuse to shut it down for other reasons and so they literally like we had to move the tournament into the casino but then the the filipino dealers that had been dealing the tournament in the convention space didn't have a license to deal in the casino so like random korean people not full-blown randoms but like border like people who busted out of the tournament had to be conscripted into dealing the tournament shortly after like weird stuff like that happens um you know certainly across europe there's a very different vibe like there's a very different vibe between a tournament you play in barcelona and a tournament you play in Nottingham in the UK, where I played a bunch when I was working for Party Poker, and then like one that you would play in Germany, um, the same way that they have you know cultural differences between those places, it very much shows up in the environment that you play around. Um, so it, yeah, getting a glimpse into that side of poker and how the culture around it differs in places, the customs around it differs in places, uh, was really cool a really cool part of that lifestyle i'm gonna have to pay more attention to that as i travel 
Uh, one thing I remember specifically was that uh, I think that American players tend to get a bit more upset when they lose compared to Europeans. Maybe it's like more of a European thing to have manners than America. Uh, than in America. That's my guess, but I'm not really sure. I have to like really look closely. That's just I've just remembered so many like outbursts coming from American players or just like displays of uh, being upset that were more obvious. Maybe it's uh, what do you think of that? Um, I don't have a strong opinion on that take, but I think that generally gels with my experience. I would say, you know, in, in the more emotional leaning countries in Europe, you might see people get a little more upset over their bust out. And then there are some more reserved cultures in Europe where you would basically like never see it. Um, and yeah, in the United States, there's a, a certainly a degree of pride that people have intertwined with their poker abilities. And when they lose, sometimes their pride or the ego is uh, slighted. Um, but yeah, I couldn't really say strongly one way or another. Okay. I'm not sure myself, but I'm going to look out for these uh, different vibes and all that sorts of things. I'm, I'm a bit curious to see what the differences are because I'm thinking of playing more tournaments lately myself. Um, uh, one thing uh, I do, one thing I really learned myself while I was, as I was traveling, as well as from reading, is that uh, as you were saying, that the history of like the rest of these places is like far, far more diverse and deeper than what you learn in America. And uh, one funny thing about history that at least uh, appealed to me was that there's all sorts of crazy stories that you would just never imagine. If you like uh, develop kind of a an inclination towards stories, or you talk with the locals, or whatever, uh, like that was what appealed me to history. And uh, um, did you find that to be an interesting subject as you traveled, or was it more like the locals that you met and the people that you met kind of thing? Um, yeah, I loved going out of my way to see you know art or architecture history in these places when when there was enough time uh, away from the tournament. Like I really enjoy going to any cultural sites nearby or even going just like the, the museums, getting tours, uh, having the tour guides fill you in on why the exhibits there were so important to the local history. Um, yeah, that was, that was among my, my favorite aspects uh, of that travel. Um, and so, yeah, I've been, I've been lucky to see some incredible historical sites in my time. Like I, I always wanted to see uh, Hagia Sophia in Istanbul and uh, just thought that that was like, an, you know, such an, an incredible piece of multicultural history. Like so many different cultures have washed over Istanbul in its, you know, two millennium of history there. And that specific site has had so much meaning to so many well, I mean, to two major religions and uh, a multitude of historic societies. And like, I, I got to see that when I was, geez, you know, let me think about this, 23, 24, something like that, you know, on a, on a poker trip that went through the Mediterranean um, on top of other sites in Istanbul. So just like having the chance to tick off the boxes and all of these places that I had heard about growing up um, or had some like, vague idea of what they were and what their meaning was to that place and then getting to see them in real life like man that's you know among the very best parts of playing poker for a living okay it sounds like you know more about uh the Agia Sophia than me I had no idea but like some of these places have this uh yeah some of them have like crazy histories behind them and I it, yeah. yeah it would probably be a bit more interesting like so, certain ones I uh was really looking forward to myself I'm trying to think um, Chad, well, why don't you go ahead, actually? It sounds I mean, like you do a bit of a Yeah, I mean, there was Hagia Sophia, which is, like, it's just an incredible building, like, both inside and outside. It's an incredible building, and it's just, like, kind of on top of this hill in Istanbul, overlooking the Bosphorus and all the boats in the sea. Um, I was fortunate. It wasn't for a poker trip, but when I was traveling a lot, I was fortunate to see Machu Picchu, which is just, like, incredible world heritage site um certainly throughout europe i mean europe is just like drenched in history and architecture it's like a living museum for an american right because our history while interesting you know our 
um, Western history only goes back, you know, a few hundred years. There's certainly a much deeper and longer indigenous history, but in in Europe, I mean, their architectural history is still so well preserved in many cities. I mean, especially you go to like Prague or Vienna or Paris, despite the fact that you know there was multiple wars that struck Europe in the 20th century, um, those places were remarkably well preserved. And uh, just going and touring the, the buildings and hearing, you know, oh, the, you know, the Medici family built this uh, this church or this building uh, 600, 500 years ago, whatever it was, or, um, you know, getting to see the canals of Venice. Um, I mean, like you could just, you could really go down the list. I mean, uh, you know, one of the, the largest mosques in the world in, in Morocco or, I mean, even, and even some like newer history, like Dubai was a place that I was always fascinated by. And it has a much more recent history because they've only had the oil resources necessary to build that place up over the last 60-ish years. And I mean, even in like the 1990s, Dubai was, was mostly desert and then it just like sprung up out of the desert into this massive cosmopolitan place with so much money and decadence and um, people from around the world and everything. Like getting to see places like that just always fascinated me. So, you know, the history there is very modern. Like I was there just as they were finishing the Burj Khalifa. It's only 10, 15 years old, but seeing places like that always fascinated me. I find it funny that, uh, you know, the middle of deserts uh, turns out to be a bit of a hot spot of sorts, especially if you're dead. It right, and it's, it reminds me of Vegas in a lot of ways. And there's certainly a lot of parallels as cities that don't really like belong where they are, considering the environment springing up out of the desert and becoming massive tourist sites with enormous buildings. Who would have thought? <laughs>